Dear friends, uh, good afternoon. Uh, it's just lovely to see that so many anesthetists, uh, anesthesiologists, and perhaps some other people joining the ESA uh, prefers to be in a dark room <laughs> Uh, at 12.15, a sunny Sunday in Stockholm. So the first speaker will be Jonas Ingemarsson from uh, Lund. Please, Jonas, this is a, a pleasure. Thank you. I have to shut on my mobile telephone too. Ladies and gentlemen, glad to see you. I was thinking about presenting this in Icelandic, but uh, I think you will uh, rather prefer English. Uh, I'm going to uh, tell you something about uh, my experience uh, using the uh, volume reflector-based anesthesia machine, which we have at the cardiothoracic unit in Lund. And I will have uh, some short uh, or few words about uh, the history of the volume reflector. Uh, my name is Jonas Ingemarsson, and I'm a consultant and a specialist in anesthesiology working at the cardiothoracic unit in Lund, and uh, this is my uh, hospital. Uh, not uh, any architectural masterpiece, but uh, it's my hospital, and I love it. You can also see from building here you have uh, the children's hospital, pediatrics, and the oncology, so it's a very big, uh, big hospital, with Scandinavian uh, measurements, at least. Uh, at the cardiothoracic unit, we do uh, about 1,200 to 1,400 uh, cases a year with the uh, heart-lung machine. Uh, we did 1,200 last year. We are planning for 1,200 this year, but we have been up to 1,400 cases. We do all the regular things, the uh, cabbage or cardiac uh, or, or coronary bypass surgery. We do valvular surgery, both repairs and replacements, uh, often a combination of uh, cabbage and, and valves. We do also a big aortic surgery on the ascending aorta, the aortic arts, and sometimes we do also in, in combination with the, the vascular surgery, and we do also, also the descending. Uh, we do uh, also grown-up uh, congenital hearts, both uh, primary operations, uh, the more simple one often, uh, ASD and so, and also retus, often a very complicated uh, operations of uh, patients who have been, uh, or adults who have been operated uh, in young age, newborn or, or in, in uh, school age. We have also heart transplantations, lung transplantations, and uh, we have done a few, but not many, both heart and lungs, the whole package. Uh, besides this, we have the lung, uh, lung side, uh, the lung operations, lung surgery, and uh, it's both open and, and also uh, video assisted operations. Uh, and also on the thoracic wall, uh, thoracoplastic because of uh, tumors or like. And of course, we have other minor operations too. These are our, our resources with the over rooms, but we can skip that because uh, I heard that I, I'm going to speak in 20 minutes. So I've been trying to cut it down, but it becomes only longer and longer. Uh, this uh, is about my experience using FlowEye, to use the straight words about it, because I think, to my knowledge, uh, FlowEye is the only machine having uh, a volume reflector technique uh, today. And I say today because there was a machine once, once upon a time in Lund, but I, I'll get back to that later. I was going to say something about the uh, servo, hist servo history, but. Uh, it would be too long to take it uh, to, to, uh, uh, too much, but, but uh, I, I would like to show you the ancestor of the servo line, the servo 900. This is actually servo 900C, so it's not so old. It was introduced in 1971, and we could say that uh, the servo 900 revolutionized the intensive care and, uh, and the caretaking of patients with, uh, with uh, ventilation or, or oxygenation problems. It has been living for 43 years, and uh, it is still going strong, in some countries at least. Uh, and, uh, but but uh, now it's a problem, we can't get any spare parts to this machine. They stopped uh, manufacturing them in uh, 2011, I think. 
it's got connection with Lund. Uh, a lot of the improvements done in this machine and, and the ideas uh, are coming from Lund, from uh, fellows who have been working there, some of them dead now, and, and others retired. Uh, there came the Servo 300 in, in the early 90s, but I will hop that too. And this is the machine we use today in our intensive care units. Uh, it uh, feels a bit old-fashioned because you have to lift some plastic uh, to, 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 to turn the knobs and so, so it, it feels a bit old when you are used to iPad and, and uh, things like that. But it's a fantastic uh, ventilator and it's doing good work, uh, helping us uh, to keep our patients alive. Uh, as I say, old-fashioned, and we know that there is a new generation coming, the Servo, uh, Servo N and Servo U, and I look uh, really forward to, to uh, use them in clinics. Uh, I, I call this my colleague from, from Lund. Uh, I'm sorry to say he is not longer with us. He, he died last year, uh, Dr. Olof Werner, and uh, I call him the father of the volume reflector uh, idea uh, because uh, it was in Lund, he, he started to use this, uh, use this uh, type of, uh, you can say, ventilation in clinics. I, I've done a schematic uh, picture of it. I did, did, did this in my computer yesterday. I've been looking for, uh, for uh, photos I had in my computer, but I couldn't find them about the system. Uh, I can start with that. this uh, tube you see here. It's a modified tube from uh, Lund, and we use uh, Googles on the patients because they often sleep with open eyes, so they want to try. Uh, this is a Servo 900, and it is driven by oxygen, pure oxygen. And you see it's an inspiratory, expiratory tubes. They were pretty short, and they were connected by a Y, y tube or, or y, y piece. And you had a very, very long uh, tubings to a circle system. So the volume in these tubings were about two liters. And of course, if, if you are ventilating the patient with, say, 400 milliliters uh, in tidal volume, you will get, get this 400 milliliters into the system, and it will back to the 0900. And nothing is going into the circle, but, but you, you give the fresh gas into the circle from, from the side. You can say. Uh, we call this a snabel in Swedish. You can uh, say it's an elephant trunk. When I was looking for uh, uh, some photos of this uh, machine, I, uh, I found, uh, found this one. But you see, it's a very messy and, and not very nice to see. You, oh, sorry. You have the servo up here, and you can see the white piece here. And, uh, we can uh, take one from the side, and now you see that this is not in the pediatric unit or, or the cardiothoracic unit, this is at the laboratorium. We were doing some uh, research on, on uh, premature lamps, so this poor Eve was uh, going through a cesarean section. But we used the same system, and you can see the snabel or the elephant trunk coming here, and it's lying in, in these big loops to the circle system. But it worked for, uh, for this, uh, for this uh, work, too. Uh, here you can see a lot of machines, but, but what you should focus on, I've also been looking for uh, old photos of, of our old uh, anesthesia machines, but this one inside here is, is the anesthesia machine we had until 2012. And it is home-built, you can say, except the uh, Servo uh, 900, which, which you can see here. And this, we used totally open system at the, at the cardiac unit. We didn't use any, any uh, low-flow anesthesia. We didn't have the snapel or, or the elephant trunk system in this machine. We had this in all our uh, operation rooms. And of course, uh, it's old-fashioned, and, and uh, even if it was doing a proper job, it wasn't uh, perfect, far from. And we, we got some money to buy new machines, and we went into this procurement process. And uh, we got, I, I expected that we would get maybe offers from, from five or six, uh, five or six uh, manufacturers, but we got only from three. Uh, it made me glad because uh, it's a very laborious process to go through. And the first machine we had was a bellow or, or bag and bottle machine. 
but uh, it was a strange in that way that this, this bag was hanging, so they eliminated the problem of auto people in the machine. So it was smart, but, uh, but it's an old-fashioned uh, te technology and, and it's not, uh, not good or, or not nearly enough for our needs at the thoracal uh, or cardiothoracic unit. I'm, I'm not really allowed to say, but, but I was lucky it broke down in the middle of the process and we disqualified it and, and it was accepted by the uh, sailors or, or the, the manufacturers because they knew they had not much to come with. We got number two. We don't have to have any names on it, but it's a piston technique. This is a machine which is widely spread in Scandinavia and all over the world, actually. It is well tested, it's reliable. It's, so I, I, I myself had used it in, in Malmö when I was working there a few years. Uh, it, was, it was a nice, uh, it was a nice uh, anesthesia machine. And then uh, there come this third machine with the volume reflector and uh, it was the flow eye. I had seen it uh, in Düsseldorf earlier at, at the uh, Medica master and uh, it was very interesting, we thought, but uh, it was new and it was not very well uh, tested in clinics. And actually last Friday I heard that uh, we were the first to run it in clinics uh, on, on patients. So in England made me a bit happy. I'm proud of it. You can ask why we bought it or, or why, why it was, why it went, why it became our choice, and what were the pros. Uh, it is this volume reflector technique, which uh, idea comes from my uh, my old uh, colleague uh, Olaf Werner, and uh, it is an advanced technology, especially in flow eye, compared, compared to the one we had in the 900. And it is safe and secure and have many uh, positive aspects for patient, uh, patient safety. Can deal with high, high uh, leakages and so and that, that's an uh, aspect which is important in, in uh, for example, uh, lung surgery. We got a fair economic deal, but it was a hard competition with the other company, you can say that. Uh, we felt this was a very new and modern design, and I know that they have been awarded the Industrial Design Award for this machine. Uh, we had a test group, five nurses and five uh, anesthesiologists, which tested the machine with protocol, and this was, uh, gave the far highest rating by the test group. The ergonomic factors were good, the interface was good, and uh, maybe uh, it was very important that the interface in some were familiar with the servo eye. And uh, some of the uh, anesthesiologists at my department are, are working as primary intensivists, but they do on-call duties, so they are in the operating room uh, once a week or, or every other week for one night or so. And uh, I felt it was very important that, that they would feel comfortable with, with the machine we were buying. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if I'm allowed to say it. It's a Swedish pro production. We are part of the uh, European Union, but uh, it, uh, it warms my heart a little bit. And uh, it's a historical uh, relation to Lund, if you think about this uh, volume reflector. Of course, uh, we had to discuss the cons by buying it. As I said earlier, it was new, uh, and we wondered, is it reliable? Will it uh, make a good test at, at our clinic? Can we use it? Uh, we were a bit tough. Over one weekend, we threw out all the old Servo 900 and replaced them with, with a new flow eye. And uh, then on Monday, we had full program with these machines. And I can say it was a bit chaotic. It was um, a lot of frustrations, uh, and uh, of course we got some uh, we got some uh, problems with with this machine, uh, newborn problems as we call them. But I feel that we had we had people from the company on scene, and they helped us as good as they could, and and uh, we got the machines going. And uh, I can say we have had this problems for a few months in the start. It, it was, uh, it was one, uh, some, some of the computer cards in the machine who, who broke down in the beginning. We had problems with leakage, but uh, the manufacturer have found the problems, where, where they come from, and uh, they are solved now. 
So now they are running smoothly most of the time, as I can say. But uh, every machine, which is so complicated as this one, uh, you can expect that uh, you will have some problems with it sometimes. But uh, life is calm for my, me now. That it's uh, easy. Uh, and we got some critics from our colleagues in other units of the hospital. We have uh, many other surgical uh, units, and uh, they, they uh, criticized us for buying a machine which, uh, which is new in hospital, while they were uh, all over the hospital, and, and even in other hospitals in Skane, they, they have, uh, they have a, another machine, the piston one, which I feel is very good. But uh, we didn't listen to this. We had to decide that we, we wanted this machine. So even it's fairly new, it's only uh, a little more than two years since we, uh, we started uh, using it. Uh, a lot of things has happened. Uh, we have new software, uh, 3.0. And as you see, there are some, a lot of new features. Uh, the, the, the uh, oxygen guard uh, safety flush is, is uh, very important for patient safety. Uh, and uh, this red uh, marked, uh, I would say, is, uh, is a feature which we had wished at, at our cardio cardiothoracic unit. Uh, this silence of the apnea alarm is, is working when we, uh, when we induce the patient, but when we have intubated and go on mechanical ventilation, it is, this, it, it is reactivated, the apnea alarm, alarm. And then we had this need of uh, heart-lung machine mode, because when we go on a pump, we have to go down in ventilation, we have the, the tidal volume first, and when the, when the surgeon cross clamp the aorta, we go down to 1 to 1.5 liters. So we always had to go in and chase all the alarm limits and lower them and change them and so on. And it took time and the machine was beeping and, and it was irritating. So we asked if we could uh, uh, get this function in it and, and uh, the company responded. And uh, now we have, uh, have this uh, function which is activated in the alarm profile. Uh, it's uh, mostly about the CO2 alarms and breathing frequency and, uh, and the volume. And you will also inactivate the apnea alarm. And uh, this works fine. It takes two seconds to activate it. And then the machine is quiet and nice. And then there's one aspect. When we go off pump, again, you have to remember to, to uh, reactivate it. But we have a good routine at it. The, the, the uh, perfusionist always asks anesthesia, are you ventilating the patient fully now? So then we go in and check and, and change it. So we, have, we haven't had any incidences with it. We always remember to, to uh, reactivate these alarms. I asked what, what is so special with, about cardiothoracic anesthesia? Well, it's not met many things maybe, but, uh, sorry. Uh, we use one lung ventilation. If, if we take the lung part first, we use one lung ventilation uh, every day, almost. And, and uh, we often get, get problems with uh, high airway pressures because of it. Because of it. We have maybe low, low uh, compliance in the, uh, in the lung which we are ventilating, while the other lung is lying still. And I feel that I got great help of the, uh, of the pressure uh, of the PRVC on the machine, so we can get down the pressure. And, and uh, the oxygenation is, is a less problem for us, because we, we, uh, we do, do the anesthesia for lung surgery with uh, total intravenous anesthesia. So we don't get the shunt problems in, in the, uh, the non-ventilated lung. And why we do it without uh, gas and use total intravenous combined with epidurals is because of the leakage of gas often in, in the lung which is uh, operated on. And the surgeons don't like the smell of it and they don't like to get uh, drowsy. So uh, that's why we don't use uh, gas at, at, the, uh, uh, at, at the lung unit. In the, uh, in the cardiac, uh, on the cardiac side, uh, there is a problem with gas delivering uh, during uh, bypass. Uh, we can use gas until we uh, go on bypass, but then we have to go over to, uh, to uh, total intravenous anesthesia. 
And uh, the reason is that uh, you, you could actually give gas on, on the pump, but there are two, two things to think about. One is it's not economical because uh, there is high flow during the gas dispenser, and you use a lot of, uh, of uh, the stuff. And, uh, and the second is that the uh, manufacturers of the uh, oxygenators, they, they don't want to validate the uh, oxygenators for just gas, so we don't know how much we get into the patient of it. So we choose to go to, actually many of us, we, we, we do it only with uh, total intravenous anesthesia and don't use gas. But uh, looking forward to see the new uh, automatic gas control, maybe we will uh, re revise our decisions there. On heart transplantations, uh, we use a nit nitrous oxide, and uh, the company, uh, we, we, have, we have used it on the servo I, we have used it on the, on the uh, 900C, and that's our responsibility because uh, the company doesn't uh, recommend it, can't recommend it, it is not validated for it. I also use it on the, on the flow I, but then you have to take into account that you have a low flow system or you can have low flow on it so you have to go up in, in fr fresh gas flow to uh, not, not get rebreathing of, of, uh, of nitric oxide. Of course we monitor the, the nitric oxide in, in the system and, and also the uh, NO2. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, okay, I think we jump further. This is just a little bit from... Uh, go, we go to the conclusions now. Uh, we feel that we have both a modern and powerful anesthesia machine. It fits well in the cardiothoracic operation theater. We have no incidents where we have uh, not felt that it's doing a good, good work. It fulfills all of our needs. Uh, we have good access to the manufacturers on all levels, maybe because they are uh, in our country, I don't know, but uh, we, we, we have no problems with that and we feel that we get good responses to our considerations about everything. And as I, as I showed you earlier, we have been able to participate in improvements of the machine. So I'm still not, uh, I still have no regrets uh, that we bought this machine. It's doing a good job, so I'm happy with it. So, thank you. <laughs>